and I think discussion of the elections in the U.S. is also very stressful. <laughs> uh, because first of all, I think that everybody thinks that oh, now I'm a fan of Trump. <laughs> but obviously people have not read it properly and that's why I suggested that we circulate it here. At least the clever people in this hall will read it and understand it properly. In fact, I wrote it as a sequel to what Mr. Shyamsaran wrote in Business Standard a few days ago, saying Hillary is our best bet. And his argument was that the familiarity that uh, Hillary Clinton has about India and her general understanding of Asia uh, will be beneficial to us. This was his point. And he also referred to a couple of conversations he personally had with her and uh, said that uh, this lady is likely to be very helpful to us. One, he said that uh, on the question of Myanmar, for example, uh, when there was the you know, point being raised as to what to do with the sanctions uh, soon after the changes took place in Myanmar, uh, the Americans were still hesitant to remove the sanctions. And Hillary Clinton happened to be in uh, Delhi and as a previous ambassador to Myanmar, Shyam was asked to speak to her. She didn't say very much to him, she just kept on nodding. But ten days later, they lifted the sanctions. So, so he feels that probably she understood uh, that issue. Then he refers to the speech she made in Chennai. I don't know whether any of you heard about it. And that was a very significant uh, speech because she thought since she was in Chennai, she was very close to the Asia-Pacific region. And uh, therefore she spelt out certain things on Asia-Pacific and the importance of Asia-Pacific to India and India's role in it. And the, and the other thing is that it apparently it was uh, Hillary Clinton who invented the word Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific at a particular conference in uh, Hawaii. Apparently she referred it to as Indo-Pacific, uh, which has caught on the imagination of many people. Because she explained it, uh, why she called it Indo-Pacific, because India is one country which straddles both the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. And therefore, the connection between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean is very important for the U.S. because they are basically a Pacific power throughout history. And so, by linking uh, India, Indo-Pacific, uh, he felt that she was going to be particularly friendly with this. And the other point he mentioned was even some of, uh, of Obama's uh, ideas, like the TPP, uh, she does not like it very much. We also don't like it. We have not joined it yet, but we are thinking about it. But uh, Hillary Clinton was personally against it uh, when this was formulated by Obama. And uh, he feels that uh, if Clinton becomes president, uh, she might revoke TPP. So these were some of the arguments that he made to say that uh, Clinton would be a good president for us. And I don't dispute any of this. It's quite possible. Uh, but what we have to look at is the, is the reality of the situation. First let me say a word about India-US relations. That's what our, our subject is. What is the state of India-US relations? And all of us heard Mr. Modi's speech at the Congress, which was a very significant speech. And you remember, he ended it by saying that the orchestra is ready. And it is the same orchestra on the side of the Indians and the Americans. But you will hear a new symphony. The symphony that the orchestras will be playing will be something new. This was the promise that he made. And he was of course referring to the latest agreements we had with Obama, particularly the one relating to the defense cooperation. Because for the, for the first time in the history of India-US relations, we became a close, close defense partner. And this is something which we have never used. Uh, but of course you know that this whole thing started out in 2005 even before the nuclear deal was signed or even even announced. Mr. Pranam Mukherjee went to Washington and uh, they signed a defense agreement for 10 years. And the significance of which was not particularly understood at that time. And uh, But then it turned out eventually that even the nuclear deal was part of that understanding that Pranam Mukherjee established. That is, in case, it was kind of a reward for India uh, for the kind of defense cooperation that we established at that time. So, Mr. Modi actually carried it to his logical conclusion. That's all that he did. Like many of the things he does, 
or actually a continuation of what has been done in the past. But he does not acknowledge it and many of us don't remember this. And therefore we think that these are all earth-shaking things that he does. But in actual fact, this started off in 2005. Anyway, so he brought it to a conclusion saying that today now we have a different kind of relationship as a defense uh, partner of the United States. And the point that he made was the most significant part of it was that in future we will now be entitled to technology transfer. Uh, like non-NATO allies, that means uh, you are not a military ally, but at the same time you are entitled to the same technological trans transfer regulations as NATO allies. And so we come to what Pakistan is often referred to by United States as, the, as a non-NATO ally. So in that sense, a new relationship has been formed with uh, the United States and this is a fact. And our relationship with the United States had never been better in terms of uh, this particular... It was a nuclear issue so far, but now we have moved into defense issues. Just to say a word about nuclear issues, the problems have not been resolved. The nuclear liability law has not been changed. It has not been accepted by the Americans. But uh, we have already announced there will be six nuclear reactors set up in Andhra Pradesh. So, and that I don't think is serious because it cannot happen. None of the American companies is willing to come as long as the liability law exists. And the whole idea of uh, insurance and things like that have not been accepted by anybody in the US. So he has side sidestepped that issue and therefore he presented this as a great new <coughs> initiative. And of course it depends on how far it will come. So it is true that India-US relations are at, at its highest. Of course the highest so far was a nuclear deal 2008 and now it is the defense cooperation. In other things there is no very, there are not many changes. Um, our cooperation in all other areas, particularly anti-terrorism is going on. There are 35 working groups working on various aspects of India-US relations. And everything is going on, things are happening in various areas. So there is nothing to write home about. But these two things, the nuclear deal which is partly implemented, and not fully implemented, but uh, the defense cooperation is indeed is significant. And this of course can be, can, you can go back in history, uh, at least till 1997. As you know, 1997 was the year when President Clinton ordered an investigation into India-US relations, why it is bad. And that is where the whole history starts, the modern history of India-US relations. And before it, it could take any shape, the committee recommended very strong relations with India and before it could be read, we had the nuclear experiment of 1998 and everything collapsed. So the whole roller coaster that we always compare US-India relations has continued since then. It goes up and it goes down all the time. So 2008 was a big landmark and uh, we were as close as we could be. And when Obama came 2010 to India, Obama came not to give us anything but to take something from us because he came with great expectations in 2010 because he was going to face his second election and the history shows that if the unemployment rate is above 7% in the United States, no serving president can be re-elected. So this was working in his mind and the only way he could have brought down the unemployment rate below 7% was if India cooperated. India should sign the $10 billion contract which Shiva Shankar Menon had promised them in 2008. And India should also buy the F-16 aircraft, another $14 billion. We should have given Obama something like 40,000 jobs in the United States. That would have brought his. So in a sense, we were, the, we were in, a, in a position, at least he thought we were in a position to get him elected or get him defeated. And that's why he came to India. And he was disappointed on both these counts. On a nuclear deal, there was no way, and because there was a liability law, and on the other hand, there was this uh, defend the, the the Rafale aircraft which we had decided to to buy, and not not F-16, which of course, incidentally, it was just signed two days ago, and therefore the roller coaster went down again. Obama lost interest in India; he got re-elected, etc. And so, it had to wait till uh, Mr. Narendra Modi came and wanted to take relations forward. And so 2014 was the next mark when the roller coasters started going up slowly. 
And there I think Mr. Modi made a lot of sacrifices in the sense that uh, he should have been very angry with the Americans for not having given him a visa for five years. And uh, Bill Hillary Clinton is supposedly personally responsible for that decision, according to many people. The president was not even unaware of it. But the great thing about Mr. Modi is that he ignored that whole point. He never said a word about his visa rejection after he became Prime Minister. Anybody would have been angry, bitter, nothing like that. So, he, his vengeance was because he did not go to United States so many years, so he went four times to United States in two years <laughs> and met Obama seven times. And, uh, and so, he managed to get these things moving. But the point I'd like to make is uh, Obama extracted a price for every step that Mr. Modi did. This we should not forget. Because uh, the first thing he did was to announce the nuclear liability or change. And that change, they thought that he would bring it about in the Parliament of India because it was Modi's party which had brought in the liability law. So why can't they just change it? And that is the expectation he gave them. But he came back, the first thing he did was to sack the foreign secretary who said the problem has been resolved. That was clear indication that there was no... Because she said it's done, it's a done deal or something she said in a press conference. The next thing we hear is the foreign secretary has been changed. So, so that, did not, that did not work. And uh, then he started working on the idea of more and more defense purchases from the United States. And after his 2014 visit to Washington, he persuaded Obama to come back to India. Historic uh, president visits a second time in the same, same tenure is unheard of. Normally, if an American president visits your country, you only celebrate the anniversary of his visit. He never comes back. Uh, but this time he came back and the price that Mr. Modi offered to him was on the India, in Indian Ocean and the, in, and the Asia Pacific. Because all the offers that were made by the United States, Dr. Manmohan Singh, or being a pivot or being an art, or, you know, entry point and this and that to Asia, he didn't reject them but he never accepted them as you know. Many envoys came and offered so many things including TPP and various things to Dr. Manmohan Singh, but then he had the advantage, he is hidden behind his turban and he doesn't have to react. So, he would just keep quiet. But all those were picked up by Mr. Modi and he gave indications to the President that if he visited India, there could be some, some brownie points that he can take back. And that's exactly what, what happened in 2015 January in the joint statement, there is a reference to Asia Pacific, which of course, angered the Chinese but pleased the Americans and then it comes to the defense agreement. So, this is the background of… Uh, so, the question you can ask is whether this roller coaster ride will continue or whether we have reached a plateau. That is what we have to examine. And uh, my suspicion was it will continue as a roller coaster ride because our interests are not always similar and the Americans have a tendency to throw out any any ally if it doesn't suit them. They are not very particularly principled about alliances, etc. So, I was quite concerned that uh, this presumption that uh, India-American relations have reached a plateau or a stable was, was, was a bit of an exaggeration. There was not going to be any new orchestra. But I wrote at that time, there will be no orchestra, no, no symphony because the old orchestra cannot play a new symphony. That is the problem with our orchestras in the US and the and of course, now we have the proof of that straight away with the Uri attack and uh, India's efforts to uh, somehow, you know, teach Pakistan a lesson. And the message we got from the Americans uh, was exactly the opposite. They, uh, they did not move an inch in order to uh, make us feel better. Because if we are such a close ally of the United States, why was it that uh, John Kerry had to go to Islamabad and come back and make some friendly noises to the word Pakistan. And also the official statement does not even mention Pakistan. <coughs> so, what difference does it make? So, you cannot be very sure that india US relations uh, are on a permanent footing. Good things happen, bad things happen. And that is what brings me to the election uh, that is confronting the US at this point in time. Of course, um, as Mr. Shyam Saran has argued, uh, Hillary Clinton is known to us and uh, she is the result of the establishment in the U.S. Exactly her problem uh, because um, 
Obama is not fully liked by anybody. And Obama continued the Clinton's policies mostly. And though he made, promised many changes, he dropped the word change from his speeches after the first year. And he did more or less the same things that Clinton did. And uh, Hillary was his Secretary of State. And so, he, the, he, this is the establishment. That is the, from Clinton onwards, it has gone on the same kind of way. There was no great surprises. Of course, Iran and Cuba withstanding. And that was a trend uh, that, we, that we saw. And um, so it is safer to predict, safe for us to predict that uh, Hillary Clinton will be good for us and may not be. We may get Mr. Chatwal as the ambassador to India, that is my only fear. I, don't, I know whether you know about Mr. Chatwal, the famous Sardarji in Washington who, who, was, who declared himself, uh, himself bankrupt in order to avoid debts uh, that he owed money to the bank, state bank. And so what he did was he became a money fundraiser for Clinton and became very close to her. And millions of dollars have been raised. And there is this hotel in Kochi uh, called Dream Hotel that belongs to him. So it's quite possible that after Richard Verma we will get uh, Sam Chatwal as the ambassador of the United States to India, which may not be a bad idea. So that is the kind of involvement. As you know, at one time Hillary Clinton was called the Senator from Punjab, people used to tease her by saying the way she talks about India as though she is a senator from Punjab and not from New York. So she has a baggage, she has a history. Uh, but if you look at her um, uh, specifically, uh, what the time are they waiting for? But technical technology is still taking care of it. <laughs> are you listening to me? I don't know. Anyway, so let me, I'll finish first. They're yes? They're listening. Okay. Uh, so, I'll just con conclude it. So, the, um, that is the one, one aspect of, of, the, of the situation. Of course, we have no control as to who will get elected. So, let us, we are not uh, responsible for anything that happens. Maybe all of you have cousins in the United States. You can influence them, asking them to vote one way or the other. Uh, but basically, India is unaffected. Indian community is only 1% of the electorate. So that also is not going to make much of a difference uh, in the elections. And the other thing, you know, many of you are politics students, that uh, there is no um, landslide elections in the United States. Because most states, it's all settled who will go for what. And it is only the so-called battleground states that matter. Uh, Florida and Ohio and other places. So the signals that we are getting is in these battleground states, Mr. Trump is making some progress. But otherwise there is no indication that uh, uh, there will be a Trump victory. And people are really afraid of it. Because what would this man do? As uh, Joseph was saying, he's an unguided missile, not even a misguided missile. <laughs> so uh, that's, a, that's a problem that all of us have. But uh, in my article, what I tried was not to favor him or say anything, but simply to look at what he has been saying about India so far and uh, whether there is any signal there that is uh, positive. Uh, the first thing is that his position about terrorism. Of course, he has changed his old position that all, his, all Muslims will be repatriated or he will build a wall between Mexico and the uh, United States. and Those kind of things he has already forgotten. And he went to Mexico, visited Mexico and told them that, no, no, you don't have to build the wall, etc. And NATO also, he used to say, well, why should we spend money on NATO, let these fellows pay and so on. So all these have already been, now that he has started getting briefings from the uh, CBI and uh, FB, sorry, uh, <laughs> CIA and FBI, he is probably not more aware of uh, interests of the United States and what the president should be saying. But then there are certain elements which will remain and first one is his anti-terrorism uh, point and uh, he'll probably go out of his way to be, to eliminate terrorism including IS, which I think is a very good thing if it happens. He will have the determination. He will save money on other things and spend it on anti-terrorism moves, he says. And that's something which is very favorable to us. And uh, he has given indications that the best partner we can have against fight against terrorism is India. And on Pakistan also he has said certain things which are music to our ears. He has said that Pakistan is the most dangerous country in the world and the way to destroy Pakistan is to go through India. So what more do we want to hear from a, 
as a presidential candidate. And then business. He has business in India, in uh, Pune and in uh, Mumbai. And if he is putting his money in India, obviously, he will put his policy also in India. And, um, and he has said that since Modi became Prime Minister, India is the place to do business. So these are the three things that uh, appear to be, not to be favourable. I said we have no reason to be too concerned, as we seem to think, if he becomes President. And we may be able to work with him, and he may be able to work with uh, Mr. Modi, because both of them are like Gujaratis. No? Mr. Trump, Trump is a bit of a Gujarati businessman, looking for profits everywhere. So there could be that, but uh, overall, uh, whoever wins the elections, I don't think there will be much of a change in India-US relations. It's a bipartisan uh, consensus, even though it's the Republican Party which is more concerned about China. And that is a factor we have to remember. I remember 1998, I was in Washington when we tested. And the kind of treatment we got from the Democrats those days, I'm sure Dr. Vikari will remember, it was unbelievable the way we were treated at that time. For two months, they would not even talk to us. We were told that you can choose the choice, you can make your choice as to what punishment you want to get. But there is no need for any discussion. You want to be hanged, you want to be drowned, you want to be poisoned, choose it. That was the line that I took all these uh, Republican senators and congressmen. And we approached all, each one of them to explain our nuclear uh, policy, why we did it, etc. But there was nobody willing to listen. They said, we don't want to hear anything. And it went on for two months till just one thing arrived there. So that is the time when I saw the true face of the Democratic Party in the US. Even the chairman of the India caucus uh, or um, others, except for one gentleman for, called Frank Pallon, who was always a friend of India, not a single Democratic congressman supported us. And two months later, Kissinger comes with a statement saying that I can understand India's nuclear tests because India lives in a tough neighborhood. And that changed the whole situation. And uh, then Brownback, the <coughs> senator from Kansas, he moved the First Amendment in order to withdraw sanctions against India. And uh, so where were the Democrats at that time? And even when you go back in history, start with Eisenhower, you know, our atoms for peace was basically a, a Republican uh, contribution. Of course, we are in between Nixon and Reagan, I'm just forgetting that. <laughs> but uh, there were others, and particularly George Bush, the greatest of them all as far as India is concerned, who gave us the nuclear deal. So that difference is there in the sense that uh, Democrats have not been so friendly when it came to these issues. That's basically for two reasons. One, China they are not afraid of. Many Democrats have argued with me that China will become democratic <laughs> one of these days. They don't think there is a big danger. When we talk about China, they think that we are talking about China in order to cover our hatred towards Pakistan. They don't think that we are really worried about China. That is, what, that is their, uh, uh, their position. And the second is nuclear. They have not reconciled to the idea that India's nuclear technology will develop. In 2007, I wrote an article saying that there will be no nuclear trade between India and the and United States. This was told to me by a very high official in the White House itself. He told me, why should we sell anything to you? We have given you the nuclear deal. You go and buy from the French and the Russians and whoever else will, will sell you. We have not made a reactor in the last 35 years. What do I have to tell, sell you? We have nothing to sell you. He said it in so many words. So he said, we gave you the nuclear deal so that you can get these things from others and we don't want to be responsible for your nuclear capability. And this was long before liability law came. 2010 only the liability law came. 2007 he told me this. And I wrote a public article on this without of course revealing the name of the person who told me, which I will not reveal even today. But uh, the important thing is that this was told to me and uh, nobody believed it initially. But till today, there has not been any nuclear deal, between, nuclear trade between India and the United States. So when it comes, we will see. So on both these things, I think the Democrats have a, a hard position on India. And therefore, uh, we could in our fight against, uh, well, fight, but our uh, uh, quarrels with uh, the Chinese and the Pakistanis, Perhaps we may get a slightly better uh, resonance from the 
I'm very okay. So other than that, I don't think we have much of a choice between them. And uh, whoever comes will be able to deal with them because India-US relations are subject to these things. It will uh, it'll go up and down a little bit, but uh, it will remain fairly, fairly stable. So this is the summary of what I wanted to say. Maybe in the discussions after uh, Vincent and uh, Dr. Vikari has spoken that we can.